Okay, so I see that Corey is already here. <laughs> I don't know where to look. Um, so I'm going to introduce you, Corey, before your um, lecture performance. Um, Corey Archangel is an artist, composer, curator, and entrepreneur living and working in Stavanger in Norway. Uh, Corey Archangel explores the potential and failures of old and new technologies, highlighting their obsolescence, humor, aesthetic attributes, and at times, eerie influence in contemporary life. Apply Applying a semi-archaeological -archeolo methodology, his practice explores, encodes, and hacks the, the structural language of video games, software, social media, and machine learning, treating them as subject matter and medium. His work has been exhibited in many solo exhibitions, um, notably at the Whitney Museum in New York, at the Carnegie Museum of Art in Pittsburgh, at the Barbican Art Center in London, or at the Hamburger Bahnhof in Berlin, um, among others. Hey, Corey, you can, you can start. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, and uh, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks to Madame and to the estate. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. Um, I guess uh, be, be here as in quotations. Uh, and this, uh, I'm excited that this is the inauguration of my streaming setup. So um, so what I'm going to do today is something called Burned Out. And it is a kind of parallel presentation uh, to the uh, essay I wrote for the Michelle Majerus catalog, uh, which is called Michelle Majerus, published by DCV in Berlin. I don't know if it's out yet. Um, maybe it's already out. Um, so that's a kind of polished New Yorker style um, long read. And this is going to be covering some of the same ideas, but be, well, I'm here. So it'll be kind of in my own words and a bit more uh, rambling and uh, unorganized. And so I hope that the two things together could uh, be nice, um, a nice pair. And, uh, yeah, I think we said lecture performance because we didn't really know what this was going to be. It's not really a, exactly a lecture. It's not really exactly a performance. So, um, okay. And the other important thing that I want to um, say is that this lecture is, or performance or whatever it is, uh, is go, has an arena accompaniment. 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 Ah, oh, I've lived in I've lived in Norway for so long. I I'm losing my English. It is a it is accompanied by an arena channel. So for those of you who don't know, arena is a um, kind of uh, artist founded and run uh, social network for organizing thoughts, videos, ideas. It's kind of like uh, a f ambient Pinterest or uh, a friendly, whatever social network you use, it's a friendly version. And I'm a power user. And so what I've done is I've put together an arena channel here for uh, for those who want to look at some of this material afterwards. And let me just share my screen now. And you could see it is there. Um, OK, so the channel is organized backwards. So the actual lecture starts at the bottom of the channel. And I'll, I'll work my way up. And these are just links to things that I had seen around the web. Uh, that I want to talk about. So each of these links to a kind of a broader resource. Okay, so I'm going to try to do this in like 25 minutes-ish. So just bear with me. It's going to be pretty quick. Um, and uh, here we go. So uh, I wanted to start with, um, well, you know what? I, I hated Majerus's work when I first saw it. I mean, I really, really, really hated uh, his work. Um, I saw first saw his work in 2002 in a show that he did at Friedrich Patzel Gallery in New York. Um, I would have been 24 years old at the time. And I will tell you what, how I remember it. And then later in this uh, thing, I will uh, kind of uh, tell you probably what actually happened uh, because after doing a lot of research about this show, I, I realized I was remembering it totally wrong, but 
what I remember was uh, walking into the gallery, which at that time was on uh, 22nd Street in Chelsea. And I remember walking in and I remembered almost immediately, like if those of you who remember Petzl Gallery at the time, there was, it was a kind of long hallway and there was a front desk on the left side. And I remember just almost immediately after the front desk seeing uh, a, a one of a, a giant black painting with Space Invaders on it, probably something, probably this or or another one. Uh, and I just remember seeing it. I remember getting so angry, and I just remember turning right around and just leaving the gallery. Uh, didn't remember the name of the artist. Didn't just just absolutely just got so annoyed, and I just <laughs> I just left. Um, some background is probably in order. I I was 24. I was I had just graduated from music conservatory two years earlier, uh, with with a degree in kind of electronic music, kind of avant garde music. I, I was you know I studied as a composer, and I I didn't have any uh, contemporary art knowledge or experience yet. I had though started to kind of creep around galleries. And I think I could explain, uh, there's probably three reasons why, or three main reasons why I, I got so annoyed. Um, one thing is to note is that in the early 2000s, New York City had an amazing, an amazing uh, net art, a net art scene. And, uh, you know, Rhizome defines net art as art that acts on the network or has acted upon it. I think that's like a really lovely definition. Although I think even the, the scene at New York was even a little bit beyond that. It, it was kind of net art, digital art. Um, there was a couple organizations around then that were were around. So Thing, uh, Wolfgang Stahle's, uh, the Thing was a kind of, uh, at, at the time I knew it as an email list where people uh, discussed contemporary art. It was also an internet service provider and Wolfgang Stahle, who founded it, uh, is also an artist, and I'll talk about one of his works a little later. There was, um, uh, this actually, Rhizome has reconstructed some of the early thing bulletin board systems messages. So for those interested at home who want to do more research, that's there. Uh, there was rhizome.org, which is, uh, um, you know, uh, started as um, a kind of platform also for communication about digital art. And uh, there was also the upgrade. I don't know if people remember this. This is, was Yael Canarek's kind of uh, get these kind of, um, it was monthly meetings where digital artists would talk about their work. So digital artists didn't have a lot of exhibition opportunities at the time. So often there were these uh, structures where people could come together and talk about their work. Now, uh, the reason I talk about all this is because of this kind of amazing scene, I was, you know, almost on a monthly basis, um, just uh, had, had the opportunity to see these amazing, amazing masterpiece artworks. And so I was seeing all these digital artworks at the time. So let me give you like three quick examples. One would be, um, I saw this work, Every Shot, Every Episode in 2001 by Jennifer and Kevin McCoy. This uh, is, uh, Jennifer and Kevin had taken the, the show Starsky and Hutch and kind of ran it th all the scenes through a database and re-edited it into all these different videos. So for example, one video would be every mirror from the whole uh, television show. Another scene would be every cough or another video would be every cough or every um, boss. And so what you had is this kind of incredible installation where you had all these video discs, you could pull one out and you could put it in a player and you could see these kind of uh, edits. So, so this, this uh, is an amazing work. I saw Wolfgang Stahle's um, Untitled. Uh, so I, I would actually talk about the whole series that Wolfgang Stahle did of webcam works. Um, where he would train a webcam on a certain location and project those webcams in gallery spaces. And these webcams would update every like three to five seconds. And they really kind of, they read as like monumental, they read as paintings, and, and also I would say like kind of Warholian um, 
he uh this particular show which i saw was the front room was the uh lower manhattan as videotaped from brooklyn and then in the back of the gallery was the Comburg minus monastery in germany as as videoed or as uh recorded by a webcam so these were i should say that these were live so you'd go into the gallery and you'd see these spaces live and um of course the this particular one untitled was was up during the 9-11 attack and and so this artwork also happened to record uh the whole attack and i saw it at the end of the show and so at the time there was you could still see the smoke um from the fires that were burning and there's a third work that i want to talk about um, which i couldn't find any uh any record of but it's by mark napier i don't know the title but he had made a web page and it just showed uh blank white and when you clicked on it it made ripples as if a pond and if anywhere was anyone anywhere else in the world saw that web page they would see those ripples and if they clicked they would make ripples and they would combine so it was this amazing uh distributed very simple very beautiful uh web performance so i i mentioned these three works or series of works because i just had no time in 2002 for painting i i i could not understand why anyone would be painting then when all of this other stuff was happening um the second thing is that uh, galleries had had in New York City started to move from Soho. And I'm going to click here on a really great book called Soho So Long by the Art Club 2000, who were mentioned a little bit earlier. This is a really great kind of book of interviews with gallerists and other people adjacent to the art industry about why, why the galleries moved from Soho to Chelsea. And in that move, the kind of modern gallery was born, the modern gallery being a kind of big industrial space. And also, it was already mentioned earlier how big galleries have gotten. This, this had started in, in the mid-90s. And so when I saw a Petzl Gallery in 2002, one of these galleries is what I walked into, small by today's standards, but then still, it just seemed enormous, smooth concrete floor. And having no uh, experience with the art industry, I, I, I was like, these spaces just radiate money, power, market, uh, inaccessibility. You don't really feel that even like you're welcome in spaces like that. So that was also kind of weighing in on me. And then the third uh, thing which annoyed me was um, uh, I, I was making digital work at the time. I was making work using video game systems. And this work was just seen as kind of second second rate uh it wasn't considered real artwork or the, it was um uh well the best example i have of that is there there were spaces to show media work in the early 2000s but often they were um well here's an example this would be the new museum's zenith media lounge which i should admit i was very happy to show in but it was you know in the basement and under the stairs and many institutions had these kind of spaces and they were always like literally under stairs in the basement around the corner uh they were secondary spaces as as digital work just wasn't considered a real valid kind of pursuit in the kind of larger art industry at the time and so when i went into Majerus's show and saw this painting of space invaders and I just was, I just thought, well, why should a painter get these beautiful spaces? Why can't digital artists get these beautiful spaces? I want these beautiful spaces. So all these things were kind of mixed up. And I was also 24. So, so anyway. Um, so as I mentioned, I didn't, I didn't bother to even, you know, find the name of the artist who made these Space Invader paintings. So what I want to talk about now is how Majerus came back into my life, kind of quote unquote, as an adult. And um, 
he came back in my life in 2004. And before I get to how, I just want to talk about some of the real basic things that had changed. So first we could talk about what changed for me is uh, I kept hanging around galleries and I kept, I mean, uh, being annoyed by galleries, but I kept going because in, in, in that annoyance, there was something that it really meant that I wanted, I wanted these things. And so, you know, slowly I learned about, you know, photography. So I learned how to, I learned how to make photographs. I learned how, uh, the, the language of sculpture. And so I, I had spent kind of 10 years, like slowly teaching myself the basic language of contemporary art. And this, you know, at some time, in some years, this was difficult. So, you know, Mike Smith, who is learning who Mike Smith was for many years, I, I put him as an example here. There was the place where I worked had a picture of him in a video on a horse with a cowboy hat. And for many years, I could not get Mike Smith and Richard Prince uh, uh, straight because I thought, oh, right. The guy on the horse, the guy with the horse is that is Mike Smith. But anyway, over many, many years, uh, I eventually figured out Mike Smith, Roberta Smith, Mike Kelly. And then the other thing that happens is, of course, the world changes. So, you know, Google happens. Uh, and in fact, Google, I would say, became mainstream because I'm, I'm Google, I think, started in the late 90s. Google was first introduced to me by a computer science friend in college, I think 99. But Google becomes mainstream. Facebook happens, if you could believe it. Um, YouTube happens. And of course, uh, Instagram happens. Uh, so th these are all the things that are happening in the background. So in 2000, and, oh, and actually just a real quick side note, also in 2014, Kevin McCoy uh, does a presentation where he, um, this is Kevin McCoy from the earlier masterpiece I showed you. He, he uh, does a presentation where he kind of proposes the technology of NFTs. So, and it was, he called it monograph. So that's a kind of side note, which is interesting. So 2014, I'm on Instagram and I see this. The, uh, this image. In fact, I literally see this and it's my same, I have my same phone here. Uh, this is New Waste, who was actually Gil Gentili, who was a production assistant of mine at the time. And I want to talk a little bit about Gil. Gil was my production assistant. And this isn't just any post on Instagram. Gil had great visual taste. Um, I liked Gil's visual taste so much that I asked him to design my book, which is called uh, The Source here. You could see it here. And you could see Gil's amazing cover that. So this is a, this is a book of source code. And yet Gil uh, presented this cover to me. And this shows you, so Gil has a really great visual sense, visual taste. And so I'm, I'm paying attention to Gil's Instagram because I know he kind of knows what he's looking at. So he posts this. And I don't know who it is. I, I, uh, there's no name, there's no artist, there's nothing. And I immediately get very uh, tense uh, because I, I'm presented with something that I almost immediately know is a masterpiece, yet I don't know anything about it. So immediately my Rolodex in my head starts flipping and I try to figure out, oh God, who is that? What artist is this? And, and quickly, I want to take you through some of the people that I thought it could be. So I thought maybe at first it could be Jeff Elrod. So this is Jeff Elrod, an amazing painter. This is a show Jeff Elrod did in New York in 2002 um, with Leo Koenig, um, which actually I, I was hanging around Leo Koenig during these years because I worked around the corner and I saw this show being installed and I saw Jeff actually pull the tape off of these black paintings. Um, but it, it didn't quite seem to be a Jeff Elrod, but it was close. So then I thought, well, maybe it could be a Wendy White. Uh, here are some Wendy White paintings from those years. She's another super, super, super painter. Um, but it didn't quite line up. It, it's, it, it, there was something um, more harsh about the Majerus. Uh, so then I thought, well, maybe it could be a Francis Reuter. Uh, and the palette 
you could see here the palette I thought lined up with Francis Reuter, but the imagery didn't quite land, land up, line up with Francis. And then my last guess was it could be a Laura Owens painting maybe. And at, at, during those years, people had started whispering about this Laura Owens series of paintings. I hadn't seen them yet, but people were whispering, she's got this new series of paintings. They're very cool. They're kind of Tumblr style. They're massive. Um, so I thought maybe it could be Laura Owens, but similar to some of the other artists, uh, this painting by Macheras, this untitled painting was just too, um, here, here's the post. And then uh, here it is on the Matthew Marks website. The, pa the Majerus painting is just too dystopic. So eventually what I thought is I, I thought, oh, this is probably some young Berlin artist. That was kind of where I landed on this. Um, some young kind of post-internet artist who, who I was, uh, I was worried about <laughs> because uh, I, I thought this was the most amazing painting. So uh, let me let me briefly talk about this painting, and then I want to just kind of come back to uh, why why I like these Space Invader paintings now. But quickly, like you know, so when I see this painting, what do I think of? Um, for me, there there's just so many elements in the painting we could talk about. I could just zoom in of on one thing, which would be maybe the phrase newcomer. And for me, what that, you know, reminds me of is here, let me get these tabs. Uh, you know, I'm right, I'm, I'm just the generation after. And so I remember like life before the internet. And I think that it's already been discussed a few times in this symposium that it's important to remember that the internet really hadn't happened yet. It existed, but it hadn't become mainstream yet. And, and so I kind of remember this life bef before the internet. And so when I see this, these, you know, these, these kind of techno fonts, I immediately kind of zoom back into, um, for me, it was this source sonic groove. This was the store I used to hang out in on Bleecker Street. This was the techno store uh, run by Adam X and Heather Hart. Um, I have a link to Heather Hart on, on my arena if anyone wants to see. So it's Heather Hart, 1999, who you could see often working in Sonic Groove. And I, I just remember being in these aisles and being dazzled by these record covers in this strange language and these strange colors. And I have a couple examples here from uh, this project here called the AUD MCR's Underground Dance Music Collection of Recorded Sound. This is a, a, a collection of trance records I bought from a retired trance DJ. I bought his entire collection and cataloged it as is without even uh, changing the order of the records. And I think it's a really good, or it has been for me a really good resource when um, researching Majerus because you can kind of see actually what trance records looked like at the time. And so there are a couple in here that seem to me like very majeric y uh, so, so for me, just that one phrase burned out just all of a sudden sends me down this spiral of all these different connections. And for him, my, for me, the thing with Majerus is there's, there's like 40 of those things in one painting. And so it's uh, here's some other kind of really great record covers that I, I find have a kind of feeling of Majerus. Although I think something that is interesting if you if someone were to go in a little bit farther, if you actually look at what all of trans records look like, they're not, they they don't all look like what we think trans records would look like. In fact, a lot of them, uh, a lot of them don't. So here's like an example of this record label called Renaissance Records. So it's it's interesting that Majerus, we associate him with this kind of look of the time, but actually it's, it is a selective look. It's, it's a look of the time of what is only new in the time. So uh, this is a great kind of interesting 
uh, other type of trans record look. Um, so now what I want to do is, uh, so, so I find out at Majeris, I think it's some young artist. Uh, I eventually corner Gil and Gil's like, oh, no, 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 no. That's, a, that's an artist named Michelle Majeris. Um, uh, yeah, I, f I forgot this part of the story. Uh, this is from 14 years ago and I completely was blown away and, um, started uh then kind of creeping around the the estate and trying you know I I kind of sought out the estate and I just said I have to learn as much as I can about this artist I don't there's so much energy coming on here and then on one of those trips to the estate paging through the catalog I I saw um the space invader or one of the space invader paintings again and was really really surprised and remembered my initial encounter with Majerus and uh, was kind of blown away. And it, actually what had happened is there were two Space Invader paintings in the show. I had remembered them as one. And uh, also when I was paging through the uh, catalog at the estate, I realized I did actually see the rest of the show because I had, I had seen the Cornhead painting. Uh, when I saw an image of that, I remembered, oh yeah, I, I did see that. And I do remember looking around the corner in the show seeing that giant uh, installation and just being like, whoa. So what I want to talk about now in kind of conclusion is to think, well, why do I like Majerus now? Love Majerus, or you know what I mean? Why is he in a kind of eternal inspiration to me now? And why did I dislike it so much then? And so a couple of things like, first is like, in the meantime, I, I came to a kind of understanding of painting and my understanding of painting came to me through the world of heavy metal. So my brother works in the heavy metal industry and that's an industry that I have a lot of respect for and kind of grew up with my whole life with my brother kind of teaching. He, he's my older brother teaching me the kind of ins and outs. And heavy metal is I think a great way to think about painting. It is an industry and it is an industry unto itself. It is an industry which has its own history and its own timeline, and it operates completely without any interference from other music industries. It is totally insular and it just keeps plugging away. And young metal bands are expected to have a kind of knowledge of the whole history. So if you're a young metal band and you don't know all the history going back to the beginning, it, it, it's actually kind of very strange. So most bands have this kind of reverence for the history of metal. And, and even though, of course, they might want to just be trying to move it forward or destroy it or whatever. And so I think it's a lot, for me, it helped understand painting that painting is this kind of, painting is its, is its own thing. And it just goes forward. It, it can be mainstream, but it can also, but, but actually its own dialogue is kind of outside of the, of other art dialogues. And it just kind of does its own thing. And painters have a knowledge of painting going back hundreds of years, and they're all just trying to chip away and just make some contribution. And so um, on my arena here, I won't, I won't punish you with but I have a kind of like a timeline between Black Sabbath to Pentagram to Sleep to Earth so you could hear this kind of um, this is just one thread of heavy metal where you could hear Black Sabbath and all these bands that came after so so painting I, I kind of came to an understanding of painting and that painting is kind of amazing um, the second um, thing is I, I I came to understand the art world as as how it relates to power. And there was, somebody had mentioned earlier, the art world became hyper about hype, the market and power. And so then thinking back on, you know, why I didn't like Chelsea Gellers at the time is I, I didn't understand that that gross feeling of, you know, these kind of blue chip galleries. And what I didn't understand, is, especially with Majerus, is that Majerus is, is working with that energy. And so when you see, you know, uh, when you see these Majerus paintings and they're installed in these spaces, Majerus knows about 
you know, blue chip painters, money, auctions. You could see it in his his diaries. He's he's completely aware and he is trying to insert himself in there and use that kind of uh, tension to the artwork's advantage. And so that's something that completely I had no concept of when I when I saw that show. And then, you know, the third thing is what I thought I was seeing with these, sorry, I'm I'm a, I'm like, I forgot to, uh, here's Cornhead. Uh, I forgot to click. Um, what I thought I was seeing with, uh, when the, I saw these Space Invaders paintings, I thought I was, you know, what I interpreted as is like some German painter was trying to be cool to buy painting Space Invaders. But what, what it really is, I think, is Majerus painting space invaders in the style of Warhol uh, or silk screening, I should say, silk screening as painting, of course, uh, in the style of Warhol. And then not to be like a painting by Majerus uh, or not to be a, a painting by an artist, but it is then to be quote unquote, a painting by Majerus. So it is totally aware that this is a painting to be installed in Petzl to be a painting by Majerus, which is using the style of another artist and to use that kind of tension of these blue chip spaces and the whole history of you know, contemporary painting and auctions to use it all as an advantage. And so in that way, like it's, it's you know, he, Majerus isn't making paintings. He's more making these kind of like performant performances or things which are to perform as painting by Majerus. And so this stuff all flew over my head uh, when I was 24, but this is kind of how I see the work now. It's a kind of, he's a kind of meta artist in a way. And I, I also link to these as I would say that perhaps these could be, you know, Stella's in pastels. You could imagine him writing in his, in his diaries. So he's always trying to, to do these um, combinations and using other artists as his, as his material. And so then I just want to talk like, just to leave you like, I think it was also important that I saw this untitled painting on Instagram. And I think it's important that I, meaning like I saw it today and meaning like, it's how it came through Instagram to me uh, and it's what it's next to on Instagram. And, you know, on Instagram, it's next to, you know, oil companies, heads of states, disinformation bots. And so I think his work has a particular resonance now because the this kind of uh, internet utopia had kind of completely fallen apart and has turned into a kind of dystopia. And I, and I, I read his work as like totally absolutely dystopic and harsh and here are some i've posted some just kind of uh some current examples of dystopic uh images and these are from the really great open arena channel yuppie dystopia uh so it's an arena for people to it's an arena channel for people to post uh things which are about the um, current dystopia yeah, that we live in. And so, uh, yeah, I think that's kind of how, oh yeah. And then of course, if you want to watch this Facebook metaverse video, this is exactly, <laughs> this is exactly the dystopia that I'm, I'm thinking of. So I think his work w works especially well now, um, as, uh, the, the world kind of, uh, heats up and, uh, and, uh, decline and all. Yeah. I don't know how to say, but we're on the verge of climate collapse. So, I mean, uh, I think his work is so harsh and so dystopic that it it has a way of meaning more now. And so I, I did want to just leave with the phrases in that painting, which is, you know, these phrases burned out, newcomer, plant explosive device, the means of deception, zero, um, fuck the intention of the artist. And so I think, I think these are really great, um, 
you know, these are not positive phrases. These are really tense and difficult things. And I think for me, that's really what the work, why the work resonates for me right now. Okay, I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Um, it, I think it was also very interesting to have this um, way of showing your influences on uh, um, this platform arena, which also reminded of maybe of uh, Majerus's way of working um, in collecting visual material. So it's also a nice uh, a nice nod to Majerus's way of working. Um, also, I like the heavy metal <laughs> uh, reference, and I think uh, Tofik, uh, our IT uh, uh, technician, probably loved it because he's really into it. Um, but um, I actually wanted to ask you a very simple question. Um, how um, this rediscovery of Majerus's work uh, actually influenced your, your reflections and your work um, in the end? Yeah, oh, it's a great question. Um, wow, that's a, such a wild question. I mean, well, I, actually, I have, a, I have a great answer. I mean, to, on Friday, I'm opening a show at the Kunstverein in Hamburg, and it's, it's literally below the Majeris show, which also opens on the same day. And in putting together that show, I was like, oh, my God, like, I have to compete against, like, it was... So the, competing with Majerus or at least pulling myself up to the same level was the was the almost impossible goal of putting together that show. And so so that's a kind of like very recent example, just you know, and it, it it's it affected the the works that I was choosing. It affected how I installed it. It affected how I talked about it. Um, you know, it's a really, really, really high bar. And as people had mentioned, he had this kind of like, he was so on and he he hadn't even really peaked yet. And it seemed almost magical how he was doing it, right? And it, I, of course, I'm like, I'm living and I'm, I'm middle-aged. I mean, to even try to get close to that zone that he was in uh, was really daunting. And And I mean, you could even see in my studio here, I mean, these are like, can you see these pink things? These are like, yes. I'm trying, so these are like really, these are um, powder coating on aluminum and the, clearly I'm thinking about Majerus when I'm making these. And so I'm just trying to, uh, I'm, yeah, so it changed, it changed everything, you know? And if, yeah, of course, aluminum, even literally aluminum is a Majerus medium, you know, so, so a lot of different ways. And then also to have, to been around the estate and have to work with the estate to, to, that also has been amazing to see, you know, how gentle and how, and how cared for the works are. And it has been, ins it's been inspiring in a whole different way, you know. Thanks. Anyone in the audience would like to ask a question or make a comment? <laughs> nope. Okay. Uh, so we're running a bit late. So maybe we uh, end it here for now. And uh, we will see you again, Corey, at the panel discussion. Thank you so much. It was great. <laughs>